stand up there in the pulpit and you say, I will teach you infinities. I will say to you that the greatest poem in the English language is the present tense of the verb to be. Now, one asks, what is the present tense of the verb to be? Now, I'll speak for you, right? It's like this. The present predictive of the verb to be. I am. Thou art. She is. He is. We are. Höchsten letzten Not, bis 
müssen wir verzweifeln und verjammern. Gibt es keine Freiheit als den Tod, doch wir sehen's im Aufschwung unserer Jugend. In des ganzen Volkes helden Geist, ja es gibt noch eine deutsche Tugend. Allmächtig eins die Ketten reißt, denn auch jetzt in den bezwungenen Hallen. Tyrannei der Freiheit, Tempel bricht, deutsches Volk, du konntest fallen. Aber sinken kannst du nicht und noch lebt. Der Hoffnung Himmels Funken, mutig vorwärts durch das falsche Glück. Es war ein Stern, jetzt ist er zwar versunken, doch der Morgen bringt ihn uns zurück. Es war ein Stern, die Sterne bleiben. Der Freiheit, goldener Stern, lass die blutigen Wolke enttreiben. Er ist in der Hut des Herrn, mag die Hölle drohen und schnauben. Der Tyrann reicht nicht hinauf, kann dem Himmel keine Stern. Für den Willen gibt es keinen Tod und des Blutes deutsche Heldenröte. Jubelt von der Freiheit morgenrot und des Blutes deutsche Heldenröte. Jubelt von der Freiheit morgenrot. Welcome everyone to Season 3, Episode 9 of Conversations with the Wind. I hope everyone is alright and spending their time wisely. Please be safe and creative out there. The song you just heard is called Lieder für das Reich, Songs for the Empire, sung by Axel Schlimper and Nikolai Nerling. The lyrics are from the poem Was uns bleibt, What's Left for Us by the early 19th century German poet and soldier Theodor Körner. In this episode, I would like to focus on the storied history and deep lore of the German people with the title, The German Literary Spirit. When we talk about German literature, it's important to remember that we're talking about the German-speaking peoples in Europe, notably Germans, Austrians, and Swiss, to name a few. But these connections go much deeper. The German literary spirit reflects the European soul, and I don't simply mean this metaphorically. Every German-speaking nation borders a layer of European identity. The Mediterranean Latin Europe in the south, the Scandinavian Europe in the north, the Gallic Celtic Europe to the west, and the Magyar Slavic Europe to the east. Through their cousins, the Anglo-Saxons, the Germanic literary spirit was carried over to the British Islands. At one time or another, Germans interacted with and influenced their neighbors, or were influenced by their fellow European brethren. The German literary spirit is driven by themes such as honor, dignity, faith, spirituality, contemplation, identity, and nature. 
These concepts reach back to ancient Germanic and Indo-European roots and form a foundational structure which can help guide us all in our collective European continuity. Regardless of our respective ethnic backgrounds, we must embrace the German literary spirit as part of our collective legacy. We must rekindle pride in the achievements of these glorious sons of Europa by reaffirming this continuity through our artistic expression. I will end this segment with a deeply emotional song titled Sunset Over the West, which was written in memory of the destructive terror bombing of the German city of Dresden. The song was written by our very own legendary singer-songwriter Heirith. You can find Heirith's music on her YouTube channel under the same name. Here is Sunset Over the West in memory of Dresden by Heirith. of the ocean tides Empires rise and so they fall When the sun sets again to rise In the next segment, I'm honored to introduce a new poet in our sphere. Quote, Adam James Davis is a writer and poet from Nottingham. His favorite topics include the fear of not only doing, but of being forgotten, and how people dream about many different kinds of immortality, from the more mundane, like with indefinite biological life extension, to the more divine, such as quantum archaeology and the singularity. If there is no death, then why can we only remember blackness from before conception? These questions are what Adam likes to write about, as demonstrated with today's poem. Close quote. Although modern in its theme, this poem echoes a profound ancient contemplative spirit. I look forward to reading more of your work, Adam. Here is Technology is Magic and the Afterlife is the Future 
by Adam James Davis, read by Nullis. I do not want to die. I do not want to be forgotten. I want to live forever. I want to be remembered. Are you in the money-making business, the empire business? No, we are in the legacy business. Build a legacy. Immortality through leaving a legacy and immortality through not dying. I want to live forever. I want to love forever. I want to be remembered. I do not want to be forgotten. Nor do I want to forget. If only I could share with you all the most ecstatic and ineffable thoughts that can only be shared telepathically, for words would only destroy the essence of that that I wish to communicate, our very own personal Akashic records, quantum archaeology and rifling through time slices and states saved and stored in our own past. Advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Technology is magic, and magic is technology. The afterlife is simply the far future. It has always been. God is a future being who is influencing the past in order to facilitate their own creation and the right conditions needed for such. I do not want to be forgotten, nor do I want to forget. There are many things I wish I could forget, but I cannot. And if I cannot forget, then how could I even hope to forgive? The next poem comes from Why We Fight, from the Antelope Hill Writing Competition of 2021. I strongly recommend ordering this seminal anthology of writers in our spheres. You can order Why We Fight from Antelope Hill Publishing at antelopehillpublishing.com. Here is When Wiglaf Last Beheld His Broken King by Thomas Nyquist, read by Nullis. The serpent spills obscenity ablaze. Each artful, wondrous thing its hoard assumes. No tower high enough to ward off doom. No perfect words can stay its lust for rape. Unseated every stone my father's laid, Uprooted every tree that bears good fruit. Their treasures bled to fill a cup consumed With poison grafted into what remains. I have no dauntless shield, nor magic sword to wield, nor strength to lift them if I did. For what is left to sate my weary soul, defeat is promised prophecy. Unborn a reasoned hope, that more than memory live, beyond the final sunset my eyes know. I close them now, and rush to war in faith, that one remaining fortune yet eludes. The foe, elixir sweet I did not form by my design but blessed with him who bleeding lies before me. Blood yet flows. The next poem is one of the most well-known Vaterlandslieder, Fatherland Songs, which was written in the early 19th century by Ernst Moritz Arndt. These patriotic anthems were written by various German poets during the wars of liberation against Napoleonic France. Ant urges his fellow Germans to resist the French invaders and condemns those who betray their homeland by actively or quietly assisting the occupiers. Here is The Fatherland Song by Ernst Moritz Ant, unknown translation, read by Nullis. The God who made iron grow did not want slaves, therefore he gave saber, sword, and spear to man in his right hand, Therefore he gave him bold courage to rage of free speech, so that he would prevail to the last drop of blood, even unto death in the struggle. What God desires, we desire to maintain with righteous loyalty, and never to split men's skulls for tyrants' wages. But whoever fights for trumpery and shame, him we cut into bits. He shall not inherit in the German land with no German men. O Germany, holy fatherland, O German love and truth, You highland, you beautiful land, We swear to thee anew, 
to the rascal and slave, watch out, let him feed crows and ravens. Thus we advance for Hermann's battle and want to take revenge. Let roar whatever can roar in bright radiant flames, you Germans, all, every man, to the sacred war together, and raise your hearts toward heaven and toward heaven your hands, and call all, every man, slavery has an end. Let resound whatever can resound, the drums and flutes. We want today, every man, to redden iron with blood, with enemy blood, French blood, O oh sweet day of revenge, that sounds good to all Germans. That is the great cause. Let flutter whatever can flutter, banners flutter and flags, we want today every man to urge ourselves to heroic death. Up, fly high, victory banner before bold ranks. We conquer or die here the sweet death of free men. I will now play a fantastic musical rendition of this poem by the eternally talented Der Michel. Please like and support his valuable work. You can find his music on YouTube under the same name. I'll spell it for you. It's D E R M I C H E L. Der Gott der Eisen wachsen ließ, der wollte keine Knechte. Drum gab er selbe Schwert und spieß dem Mann in seine Rechte. Drum gab er ihm den kühnen Mut, den Zorn der freien Rede. Dass er bestände bis aufs Blut, bis in den Tod die Fehde. So wollen wir, was Gott gewollt mit rechter Treue halten. Und nimmer im Tyrannen sollt die Menschenschäde spalten. Doch wer für Tand und Schande ficht, den hauen wir zu Scherben, der soll im deutschen Lande nicht mit deutschen Männern erben. O Deutschland, heiliges Vaterland, o deutsche Lieb und Treue, Du hohes Land, du schönes Land, dir schwören wir aufs Neue. Dem Buben und dem Knecht, die Acht der Vötre, Krähen und Raben. So ziehen wir aus zur Hermannschlacht und wollen Rache haben. Lasst brausen, was nur brausen kann, in hellen, lichten Flammen. Ihr Deutschen alle, Mann für Mann, fürs Vaterland zusammen. Und hebt die Herzen Himmel an und Himmel an die Hände. Und rufet alle Mann für Mann, die Knechtschaft hat ein Ende. Lasst klingen, was nur klingen kann, Trompeten, Trommeln, Flöten. Wir wollen heute Mann für Mann mit Blut das Eisen röten. Mit Henker und mit Knechteblut, o oh, süßer Tag der Rache, das klinget allen Deutschen gut, das ist die große Sache. Lasst wehen, was nur wehen kann, Standarten wehen und fahnen. Wir wollen heut uns Mann für Mann zum hellen Tode mahnen. Auf Fliege stolz des Siegs panier voran den kühnen Reihen. Wir siegen oder sterben hier den süßen Tod der Frage. I will now play two poems in both German and English by tonight's guest, Köln Brüder. The first poem I'd like to present to you today 
is called Einfach Zeitlos Schön. It was written in November 1995. Einfach Zeitlos Schön. Sie sind die Handschellen der Zeit. Wenn Sie rufen, sind wir stets bereit. Termine sind Beton und werden nicht verschoben. Modischer Stil von Swatch wird gern gestohlen. Doch Sie haben den gleichen Zweck, verwandeln uns in willenlosen Dreck. Sie rufen, wir springen, lassen uns ihren Druck aufzwingen, ohne Rast noch Ruh. Nur der Penner schaut belustig zu, denn er hat kein Geld für eine Armbanduhr und misst die Zeit an einer Angelschnur. This translates into the following. Simply timelessly beautiful. They are the handcuffs of time when they're cold. We're always ready. Appointments are concrete and won't be postponed. Fashionable style from swatches likely to be stolen. But they have the same purpose, turning us into mindless filth. They call, we jump. Let us impose their pressure without rest nor peace. Only the bum watches with amusement, for he has no money for a wristwatch and measures time on a fishing line. The next poem is called In der U-Bahn and was written, I think, around 1997. It goes as follows. In der U-Bahn Wie ein unheimliches Fließband, langsam gleitend an der Wand, überwindet es die Schräge, macht uns aber schwach und träge. Waren einst die stolzesten Wanderer der Steppe, Übrig ist fettes Fleisch auf der Rolltreppe. And this translates into something like this. In the underground, like an eerie conveyor belt slowly gliding along the wall, it overcomes the incline but makes us weak and sluggish. We were once the proudest wallows of the steps. What's left is fat meat on an escalator. Hermann Karl Hesse was a famous German poet, writer and painter. To many, he was a controversial figure who openly opposed both nationalism and Marxism. Yet he also criticized modernity for its materialism and decadence in destroying European culture. Hesse organically represented an age-old longing to understand the individual's authentic place in the greater order through genuine spiritual reflection. In spite of his beliefs, or perhaps because of them, his work remains an important part of understanding our current artistic expression. In 1946, he received the Nobel Prize in Literature. Here is Der Dichter by Hermann Hesse Read by Kern, Bruder. Der Dichter Nur mit dem Einsamen scheinen des Nachts die unendlichen Sterne, rauscht der steinerne Brunnen sein Zauberlied. Mir allein, mir, dem Einsamen, ziehen die farbigen Schatten wandernder Wolken, träumen gleich übers Gefild. Nicht Haus noch Acker ist, nicht Wald noch Jagd noch Gewerb mir gegeben, mein ist nur, was keinem gehört. Mein ist stürzender Bach hinterm Waldesschleier. Mein das fruchtbare Meer. Mein der spielenden Kinder Vogelgeschwirre. Träne und Lied, einsam Verliebter am Abend. Mein auch sind die Tempel der Götter. Mein ist der Vergangenheit ehrwürdiger Hain. Und nicht minder der Zukunft lichtes Himmelgewölbe ist meine Heimat. Oft in Flügen der Sehnsucht stürmt die Seele empor, seliger Menschheit Zukunft zu schauen. Liebe, Gesetz besiegend, Liebe von Volk zu Volk. Alle finde ich sie wieder, edel verwandelt. Landmann, König, Händler, emsiges Schiffervolk, Hirt und Gärtner, sie alle feiern dankbar der Zukunft weltfest. Einzig der Dichter fehlt, er der vereinsamt Schauende, er, der Menschen Sehnsucht Träger und bleiches Bild, dessen die Zukunft, dessen die Welterfüllung nicht mehr bedarf. Es welken viele Kränze an seinem Grabe, 
aber verschollen ist sein Gedächtnis. Here is The Poet by Hermann Hesse, translated by James Wright, read by Nullis. Only on me, the lonely one, the unending stars of the night shine. The stone fountain whispers its magic song to me alone, to me, the lonely one. The colorful shadows of the wandering clouds move like dreams over the open countryside. Neither house nor farmland, neither forest nor hunting privilege is given to me. What is mine belongs to no one. The plunging brook behind the veil of the woods, the frightening sea, the bird whirr of children at play, the weeping and singing lonely in the evening of a man secretly in love. The temples of the gods are mine also, and mine the aristocratic groves of the past, and no less the luminous vault of heaven in the future is my home. Often in full flight of longing my soul storms upward to gaze on the future of blessed men, love overcoming law, love from people to people. I find them all again, nobly transformed. Farmer, king, tradesman, busy sailors, shepherd and gardener, all of them gratefully celebrate the festival of the future world. Only the poet is missing. The lonely one who looks on, the bearer of human longing, the pale image of whom the future, the fulfillment of the world, has no further need. Many garlands wilt on his grave, but no one remembers him. Karl Theodor Körner was a German patriot who embodied the virtue of the true warrior poet. In numerous battles, he demonstrated personal bravery and inspired his comrades with fiery patriotic verses, including Schwertlied, Sword Song, which he wrote during a lull in fighting only a few hours before his death, and Lützow's Wilde Jag, which was set to music by both Karl Maria von Weber and Franz Schubert. Many people of his era dubbed him the German Tiratus. In 1813, Körner died a hero's death at the early age of 21. Here is Abschied vom Leben by Theodor Körner, read by Nullis. Die Wunde brennt, die bleichen Lippen beben, ich füß an meines Herzens mattern schlage, hier steh ich an dem Marken meiner Tage. Gott, wie du willst, dir hab ich mich ergeben. Viel goldene Bilder sah ich um mich schweben, das schöne Traumbild wir zu Totenklage. Mut, Mut, was ich so treu im Herzen trage, das muss ja doch dort ewig mit mir leben. Und was ich hier als Heiligtum erkannte, wofür ich rasch und jugendlich entbrannte, ob ich's nun Freiheit, ob ich's Liebe nannte. Als lichten Seraph seh ich's vor mir stehen, und wie die Sinne langsam mir vergehen, trägt mich ein Hauf zu morgenroten Hören. Here is Farewell to Life by Theodor Körner, translated by G. F. Richardson, read by Nullis. My deep wound burns, my pale lips quake in death. I feel my fainting heart resign its strife and reaching now the limit of my life. Lord, to thy will I yield my parting breath. Yet many a dream hath charmed my youthful eye, and must life's fairy visions all depart. O oh, surely no, for all that fired my heart to rapture here shall live with me on high. And that fair form that won my earliest vow, that my young spirit prized all else above, and now adored as freedom, now as love. Stands in seraphic guise before me now, and as my fading senses fade away, it beckons me on high to realms of endless day. I was able to find an English translation of the next poem in the book 
The Life of Carl Theodor Körner, with selections from his poems, tales, and dramas, translated from the German by G. F. Richardson. Here's a brief introduction. Quote, the following is a translation of Körner's celebrated war song, written on the morning of the Battle of Dannenberg on May 12, 1813. Close quote. I will also end this segment with a song in German based on this poem. The music was composed in 1815 by J. H. E. Bornhardt. Here is War Song by Theodor Körner, translated by Lord F. Egerton, read by Nullis. Darkly dawning, death enshrouded, breaks the great, the dreadful day. And the sun, all cold and clouded, lights us on our gory way. In yon hosts that now assemble, fates of mighty empires lie, and the lots already tremble as they cast the brazen die. Brethren, this hour as it dawns on us now, impels us to join heart and hand in the vow, to be true while we live, to be true if we die. Behind us, in the gloom of night, lie defeat, disgrace, and shame, all wherewith the tyrant might disgrace our nation and our name. Our native tongue was all profaned, our country's temples overthrown, our faith destroyed, our honor stained, and could we weep those glories gone? No, vengeance inspired us to join heart and hand to avert heaven's curse from our loved native land, and to save her palladium ere yet it was flown. Before us what bright scenes are given, the glorious future's golden dreams, and see, through opening gates of heaven, the lovely light of freedom gleams. Native arts again shall meet us, native songs dispel our gloom. All that's great again shall greet us, all that's fair again shall bloom. Yet a horrid uncertainty rests on you strife, and though glory's the prize, yet the stake is life, and our victories but hasten us on to the tomb. Yet with God we'll seek the field, there devote our latest breath, our lives an offering we will yield, and brave through him the power of death. Yes, to save thine ancient glory, fatherland will die for thee. Those we love shall tell our story, those our deaths shall render free. And the tree of thy freedom immortal shall bloom, even though its fresh branches shall wave over our tomb. Here, O oh, our country, our offering for thee. Turn your looks yet homewards, where love was wont erstwhile to bloom, ere the tempest of despair swept its blossoms to the tomb. And if tears unbidden come, tears disgrace not valor's eye, waft one kiss to love and home, then commend their cause on high. All the fond lips for our safety that pray, all the loved hearts that bled for us today, comfort and succor them, God of the sky. Now, then fresh to yonder fight, turn with eager heart and brow. All of earth has taken its flight, heaven alone is with us now. Then let every valiant brother prove himself a hero here, True hearts see again each other, now farewell to all most dear. Hark, hear ye the shouts and the thunders before ye. On brothers, on to death and to glory, and we'll meet in another, a happier sphere. <laughs> Thank you.
In the next segment, I'm honored to have Köln Bruder as my special guest for this week's conversation. Hello, it's great to have you on the show. Could you tell us a bit about yourself for those who may not be familiar with your work and background? Also, please let the audience know where they may be able to find you. Thank you for having me. I am a German patriot, have been for about six, seven years, came from more or less the exact opposite, as many have, um, and uh, Cologne Cathedral night with uh, rapey refugees was more or less the turning point in my life. As the name alludes to, I am not one, but I am two. I have an identical twin brother. And we're doing the Köln Brüder, which means Cologne Brothers, literally. And we have a YouTube channel. We have a Telegram channel. Uh, we're on Odyssey. We're on BitChute. Um, yeah, that's about it. And every now and then I pop into uh, American or English speaking uh, podcasts to let the world know, hey, these Germans, they aren't, aren't all completely stupid and having fun uh, looking at their land being taken away. Well, that's nice to hear, and it's good to know. Um, just for the audience's sake, the Köln Brüder is spelt C-O-E-L-L-N-B-R-U-E-D-E-R. -E -E and you can find him on Telegram, on YouTube, on Odyssey, and on Twitter as well, right? Yeah, I, I am on Twitter, but that's only me, myself. Um, mm -hmm. As I was saying, uh, usually the content is usually created by my twin brother and me. Um, with the ideas, one one coming from him, one coming from me, and uh, then we usually do these short films. We've noticed that the attention span of Modern Man isn't all that uh, sufficient to make like two-hour podcasts in Germany, so we have been specializing on doing short films, um, some uh, parody songs, um, usually nothing as much longer than five or eight minutes, five to ten minutes, but most of them are two and a half, three minutes really right. short stuff well i'm i'm notorious for torturing the audience with three hour shows so <laughs> so you're in a, you're, you're in an excellent place right now <laughs> if brevity is the soul of wit and tediousness the limbs and outward flourishes i will be brief let's <laughs> let's try to make it a bit shorter than usual huh? <laughs> well, well we'll try we'll do our best um i always say that in the beginning that we'll make it short and it always turns out to be a long conversation but usually the audience loves the conversation and the guests so um, I think they got used to the torture. <laughs> um, let's open this segment with the general theme of the German literary spirit. I'm going to kick off this conversation with the first question. Mm -hmm. uh, which elements do you feel best characterize German poetry and literature? Which stylistic and thematic characteristics distinguish German poetry from other European literary traditions? For example, English poetry. All right, the elements that best characterize German literature are really everything that is connected with nature. We're sort mm -hmm. of extremely fond of nature. We have the the forest is like our our desired space. We we are somehow still fixed to to the forest in a way. That's for instance uh, one reason why we're so obsessed almost with recycling. You know, we we're just obsessed with protecting nature. We have this absolute certainty that we are a part of nature and not uh, someone who uh, who got it from God and here you, you take care of it, but it's yours and do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. We somehow have this awareness of being part of it. And, and this this goes back to ancient times, too. I mean, this isn't a new absolutely. phenomenon. You can read this in Tacitus Germania. Uh, he will, uh, for those who don't know it, it's a Roman writer who went to early Germany and uh, he was more or less characterizing the different tribes in Germany, which are quite different. I mean, the funny thing is, um, in, in French, we're Allemand, because mm -hmm. the uh, Alemannen, they, they live close to the French border. Uh, in the very northeast, we're called um, Niemicki by the Polish, because mm -hmm. there was a, a tribe called Niemicki. All the different, all the uh, um, countries that are around us, they have names for the tribe that was bordering close to their country. So we were never really realized to be one people. At least that's what the the, the other people around us mm -hmm. they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't um, see us as one people, but more like 
this this mix of of different tribes, right? The, the Swabia people, the Bavarians, um, and so forth. Depending on which country was neighboring to it, they'd have the name of that tribe for the entire German people. Yeah, and, and you still only... have that today in Germany, right? Where you have what they call the local patriot, or the local patriots who are... Yes, absolutely. And it's perfectly fine to be a local patriot, you know. Even here in Cologne, which is like the most leftist city that you can ever imagine. I mean, take Seattle and take it by five times or something. <laughs> and you're just about there. And uh, here, you can, you can love this city, you know, but uh, leave out the Cologne and, you know, you're the worst human being who ever wandered the earth. <laughs> It's really a bizarre thing, seriously. Um, yeah, you you can be the most uh, patriotically minded person towards your con towards your city, but as soon as it gets to to all of Germany, you're doomed. You you turn into a monster. When I was young, I was a fan of Herbert Grunemeyer, of his music, and I only found out later in life that he's a committed leftist. I mean, a huge leftist, and also the I always liked the band Bop uh, that's from Köln as well. Mm -hmm. And then I find out that they're also committed leftists, right, later on in life. But their music is really good. Grunemeyer, for example, which I found fascinating, he wrote this beautiful song about his uh, wife who passed away. And it's, it's a really beautiful song. And, and then he, he calls his wife Nordisch Nobel, right, which is the Nordic noble, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yet here's this man who's this open borders, leftist, virtue signaling globalist. And he's this huge local patriot. He's from the city of Bochum, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and he's this huge local patriot. He calls his wife this Nordic noble, yet he professes all this, this insane uh, politics. So it, it, it's, it's really fascinating in many ways for, for a non-German or from an outsider perspective to look at these things and try to understand it, really, because it's, it's unless you've lived in Germany, fortunately, I've lived in Germany for... Uh, about 11 years in total. So I kind of sort of understand it, but I wouldn't say that I fully understand it either, even though I've been there for many years. I, I would say that Germany in many ways is a, a country of contradictions of so many levels that it's fascinating. Absolutely. Uh, but for one thing, uh, do never try to understand the lefty. It just, you know, they don't understand themselves. Yeah. There's a funny <laughs> story that occurred just uh, just yesterday, I think. There was a, a Fridays for Future. They, they want to do some sort of, um, I don't know, function, whatever. And they invited a musician and it's a white woman and she has dreadlocks. Because of cultural appropriation, they told her, well, we're really sorry, but you can't, uh, can't show up. And... Uh, yeah, you, if you cut your dreadlocks off, you can. <laughs> and see, uh, at the same time, they have this uh, Carola Rakete, who is this captain. She's um, she's captaining the the uh, refugee boats, uh, mm -hmm. pulling in all these uh, illegal immigrants into our country. She's wearing dreadlocks. No one cares, you know. Yeah, it, yeah. it's they have this double standard that uh, they have turned completely blind to. They, I, I don't know if they don't realize it. If they uh, are just, you know, um, I don't, I just don't know how they do it you know, yeah. to, to overlook this this obvious uh, double standard, and I've given up. There's this nice expression in Germany, etwas links liegen lassen. It's it's an idiom for saying uh, just let it be, just leave right. it be. And the literal translation is leave it be to the left. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> just links liegen lassen, you know. We we had better proceed with something more interesting than these people. You mentioned the literary element of nature in German culture, how strong and deep it is. Mm -hmm. And many times you'll see how the Green Party has gotten so popular in Germany over the last maybe 30 years. I lived in Germany in the 70s and 80s, late 70s mm -hmm. to the late 80s. Back then, they were a fringe group, bunch of protesters, hippies. You know, yep. no one took them seriously. And, um, you know, they were the guys that kind of dressed strange and ate weird food, you know, the proto-vegans, if you will. So these people suddenly became extremely popular in Germany. And I believe that they tapped into something ancient, even though they misappropriated it, in my view. And I think that they changed the uh, organic understanding of the love of nature. And this is mm -hmm. a theme that I've, I've touched upon in the past, where I say that environmentalism, to me, is a fetish. Conservationism, protecting nature, protecting your environment, keeping a clean environment, is actually a right-wing philosophy. 
So what you see today is is this strange misappropriation of this deep lore in German culture of the love of nature, and it's twisted into some kind of pseudo-Marxist ideology. Yeah, the fun thing is that most of the uh, founders of the Green Party, there were some Nazis, some old Nazis actually, and uh, a lot of uh, communists. So, yeah. um, Very like strange, uh, right? Kretschmer, the current uh, prime minister of Baden-Württemberg, which is a state in uh, the south of Germany, he was uh, a caterer from, from the Communist Party. The uh, current uh, Bundes Chancellor, the, the what do you call it? federal chancellor, he was big in the in the GDR. He went there. He had uh, meetings with the party SED, the uh, Socialistische Einheitspartei, so the um, which is the uh, the only party, like the KP, more or less. So it's absolutely uh, obvious that that the current political elite is entirely communist or at least socialist um, prone. And uh, we have this saying in, in Germany about the Green Party, they're sort of like watermelon. You know, they've, um, <laughs> they're green on the outside, uh, red on the inside with a lot of brown little uh, kernels. So... Um, <laughs> Um, it, it's just it's just uh, so obvious, and and now they have this um, foreign secretary. She, uh, you probably don't get this because the interpreters will not uh, interpret all her all of the mistakes. She needs a uh, logopedic therapy. Seriously, right. she has severe problems formulating just one uh, correct sentence. It's it's so embarrassing to to listen to this woman. Wir müssen Europa gemeinsam verenden. We have to end Europe together. Yeah. And and some of these, uh, w when you take them seriously, would be uh, like completely insane. Yeah. And and this woman is being taken serious. And the Greens now want are are regretting that she didn't become chancellor because she's such a great stateswoman now. Now with this Ukrainian uh, Russian crisis, mm -hmm. it's it's absolutely b bizarre what's what's happening. They, they're trying to create comic book heroes out of politicians nowadays, I mean, especially in the West, and it's, it's kind of ridiculous. People who are otherwise fully incompetent are being raised to a status of hero, but if you scratch the surface, then you always get the same incompetent person, you know, mm -hmm. the administrator or what have you. So you said nature characterizes German poetry and literature. Are there other elements that you feel characterize German literature? Yeah, of course, the language itself. Mm -hmm. See, in English, um, that's my problem always when I translate some some German sentences into English. You have this extraordinary, extraordinarily strict uh, SPO. You can't turn around the words as I'm used to. And in, in the German language, because you have the endings that define the position and the function of the word, you can you can more or less turn them around the way you want. And right. that way you can stress certain aspects of a sentence. And you, mm -hmm. you can't do this the same way in English than you can in German. That's one and, grammatical aspect. Mm -hmm. And there's also a morphological aspect to it. Um, probably, you know, in, in German we can make these um, composite nouns. For instance, one of my favorite words, uh, Gaszug Rückholfeder. That's the little spring that pulls back the wire that's pulling on the carburetor to let some fuel in. And that's the reason why we're so... So good at engineering yes. because we can assign to each and every single part in the car one specific word. And once this word is defined, everyone knows what it is. You're mm -hmm. a mechanic, you know that word. You know it's exactly what sort of spring that is, how it's supposed to work. You can order it in the catalog and so forth. And uh, I think that's what makes, uh, that also has, of course, an, an impact on, on the literature. Mm -hmm. Because we will more play with these long words which are probably to the amusement of other people. <laughs> in the United States, Volkswagen at one time was advertising Fahrvergnügen. The Americans were just eating it up because they, they just love these long words that have no meaning in English. Like if you were to translate it literally, you'd have to write a whole sentence. But in, in German, it's one word. Yeah. And, and it's, it's fascinating. And I've always found that to be very uh, unique to the German language. Oh, actually, uh, the Greek can also make these nominal compounds, um, oh, okay. and some, I think, in Farsi they also can do that. But you're right; it's it's uh, pretty characteristic for German for these sort yeah. of languages. Hungarians can also have these very long words. 
And if you're Hungarian, that doesn't matter if it's a created word, they'll know exactly what it means. Ah, okay. In German language, the uh, verbs, they take on prefixes and the mm -hmm. prefix will entirely change the meaning of the verb and mostly on a metaphorical um, meaning. For instance, to take in German means nehmen. Mm -hmm. Annehmen would be to receive or to accept. So it's something that you take on, literally. <laughs> And, and so forth. And, and that's how the entire German language is made up because then uh, annehmbar. So now you have the uh, adjective to it. It's, yeah. it's acceptable. <laughs> so, and this is, uh, German works a little bit like a Lego set. You know, you, mm -hmm. you put something in the front, in the back, and, and then you redefine the meaning of it entirely. And you can make new words, which is very creative. You can be very creative with the German language yes. just because you have these these grammatical and, and morphological uh, possibilities with it that English does not allow. And uh, I've, I've studied a couple of, of foreign languages, especially Portuguese, Spanish, um, and all the Romantic languages are rather boring when it comes to that. You also have to describe it a bit like in English. But uh, mm -hmm. English, uh, especially when, when you read something old like Chaucer, you'll notice that uh, it's actually uh, very close to German. But we'll get to that later. I'm okay. kind of looking forward for that question, actually. <laughs> We've touched upon the stylistic and thematic characteristics mm. that distinguish German poetry from other European literary traditions. Are there any other distinguishing characteristics in uh, German poetry or literature that you think would be worth noting? I'm not really the expert on modern literature. But when it comes to the old ones, um, especially if you take people like Hermann Hesse, like Rilke, like uh, Ringelnatz, people somewhere between uh, 1800, 1900 something, they took great care of making sure that they had a nice sound to it. So the mm -hmm. metric was very important. The uh, the rhyme scheme was very important. They wouldn't they wouldn't refer to like the old classical forms like a sonnet or something like that, even mm -hmm. though Hesse did that at, at, at times as well. But other than that, I'm not that much of an expert on other um, European liter literary traditions, other than maybe uh, in the Portuguese uh, time with Salazar regime. Mm -hmm. uh, they developed a, a very intriguing way of coding their language because they had an, um, a censorship office. They developed um, something of a of a coding system. So one uh, a certain flower would mean this, and 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 so on. Uh, in in Tamil literature, there you have something else, something similar. You have these um, five different landscapes, and each landscape means something else. Like the forest means always the early secret love, because that's where a young couple will will hide out. So they they had to come up with an entire uh, like an enigma code to write books to talk about the uh, certain aspects that they wanted to criticize without being thrown into the in, into jail. I think you will see this in German literature. You can see this already now. Mm -hmm. um, there's an interesting guy, Thor, oh, I forgot his last name. He wrote a really fantastic book um, in the style of a dictionary, stating that this is um, political correctness to German. And uh, he sort of translated all this euphemistic language that has popped up in the recent years uh, into real German, what it really means. And that's probably the hardest book I've read in, in years <laughs> because it's, he's not make he's not taking any prisoners. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean it's, oh yeah. Uh, he's just so extremely honest about everything, uh, about, about these uh, euphemistic formulations and he's just picking them apart in, and, and just uh, analyzing them uh, to death. And that's a really good book. Mm -hmm. And how have uh, ancient Germanic roots influenced German literary themes and concepts? Okay. Now, of course, here we come to the Edda. You probably heard of it. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's not only um, the Scandinavian people, but uh, interestingly enough, the uh, Nibelungen saga, uh, the Nibelungen saga, you would say in, the, in English, um, it also is contained in the uh, younger Edda. And the central theme that is... Now in the German uh, German spirit is the Nibelungen Treue. That is the um, so the loyalty the, to the Nibelungen. The, 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 the tr yeah, but the the blind loyalty, the blind obedience. Right. That uh, and um, it's often said that 
the Third Reich could only happen because of this uh, blind obedience that the Germans are prone to, and that because of that, uh, the Germans must never again have a strong military, and they must never again. Uh, this never again is like it's like a mantra. That, mm -hmm. that you hear when when you enter school, you will hear this mantra: never again, never again, never again, and it's it's repeated over and over again. And you are the bad guy. You are the bad guy. <laughs> you and have it in your that, blood. You have it in your blood. But there are no races. But you have it in your blood. You know. It's yeah. So this loyalty, this blind loyalty, that is a uh, a deep part of uh, Germanic cultural lore, is used against the Germans essentially. Today it is. I think so too. I think so. Yes. There's another aspect from the Nibelungen, and that's the betrayal. Mm -hmm. And um, my my wife keeps telling me, uh, it, you know, you can't be mad at someone uh, to to come to a place like here and, uh, you know, to take uh, advantage of the money that you get and all these things. Mm -hmm. um, but you can be mad at people who allow this to happen. Right. And uh, so the traitors, more or less, that's especially here uh, in the November uh, of 1918. You had these Novemberverbrecher, as, as Hitler called them. They were the ones that uh, signed this Versailles Treaty. Right. And the, the Marxists that even during the war um, fell into the back of the fighting forces and thereby caused the defeat. At least that's how some describe it. And so this is also a central theme in, in German literature is the betrayal, you know, the right. treason against the, against the family, against the company, against, the, against an entire people, whatever. Against the tribe, if you will. If you against go back the, to the tribe. Yeah, of course. Exactly. And these all have their roots in ancient Germanic traditions, if I understand it correctly. It could be, or may, maybe the the ancient literature was only um, so good at pointing out. Look, this seems to be a characteristic of you people. Mm -hmm. um, you you tend to, you know, when you see your own uh, advantage, you always have some bad apples in in the basket, and they tend to, you know, become traitors. Right. That's with other people the same. I would I would suppose, but obviously yeah. uh, with us uh, Germans. That was always something very central because it was it like seen as the lowest thing to do. If you lived in a small tribe of a couple of hundred people, in a, you have to imagine back in the days, Germany was entirely forest and swamp. So you had to you had to get your little piece of land to to keep your cattle to do your farming, and uh, if you were betrayed and and some. Other people came and just took away everything from you, especially the women, the cattle, what not. Mm -hmm. You were screwed. Right. You, your tribe was was about to die out. And, and uh, that's, uh, especially when you live in these small communities, um, that's what makes it extremely horrible to, to, uh, to betray your own people. Exactly. And that's why yeah. this has become a, a very central theme in, in German literature. And it's interesting, again, how these central themes, these ancient themes are twisted again and again against the German people in this, this postmodern contemporary world that we're living in, where these natural understandings of self, of community, of one's place in the community that have been ingrained in the German culture going back centuries, if not eons, and so now in this world, it's being twisted into uh, working in favor of something that is going against the interests of the German people. If you speak up against the open borders policies, then you're a traitor. If you um, speak up against various forms of cultural misappropriation or cultural subversion, then you're betraying this communal sense of understanding of self of what it means to be a German in this modern age, which is a twisted understanding, in my view at least, which is kind of a twisted understanding of what it means to be German. And so what, what you're seeing is that a lot of what, what's happening, and this isn't, I, I would say this isn't just happening in Germany, this is happening throughout the West, where you will see these ancient organic understandings of self and relationships of local patriotism, if you will, 
that is being used against the very people. And so it's being used against us. They're incorporating other elements into it. And now they're saying, well, if you don't follow this line, then now you're a part of the problem. You're someone who doesn't follow tradition. And they're, they're redefining tradition, if you will. Absolutely. And not only with um, um, with open borders policy, with anything, mm -hmm. uh, if, if you were um, like anti-vaxxer, you, you were a traitor, you were not being, uh, you weren't showing the solidarity that it takes to, you know, to tackle this horrible, horrible disease. Now with Ukraine, they're looting Russian stores, uh, Russian people are having their, their trucks cut open. The, mm -hmm. the planes from the trucks, the, the tires cut. Um, it's, it's, it's. And they say it, never you, again, it's, right? <laughs> yes. And at the same time, they're saying never again. And, and they're doing it over and over again. Yeah. And, you know, it, people will, will take their social media account and, and make the uh, Ukrainian flag with it. And if you don't, uh, you're a bad person. Just a day ago, they would have still their mask on. So they turned from vi virologist to uh, um, uh, to military expert within right. the course of a day. Actually, we know nothing about this. We know nothing what's going on. Right. There have been so many false flag um, uh, videos popping up on the Internet. We know nothing of this conflict. Yeah, yeah. You know? We should just stay stay the hell out of this. <laughs> I mean, if, if German history should have should have taught us anything, it's stay the hell out of any conflict that's not on your own soil. Right. But still, hey, now we're sending weapons. This is so insane. Yeah. As soon and as you send weapons, we we have now this government. Uh, they are going against the peace treaty that they have with Russia. We're now officially at war with Russia. If they were to declare it. Because we sort of, you know, we didn't stick to the treaty. We're veering somewhat off from the literary and uh, mm -hmm. topic, but I think it is important to note. I have many friends in Germany and, you know, I get feedback from them on what's going on. I have friends in Austria and Hungary, but all, all over Europe and also in the United States. And I see this more as a Western issue. West By the West, I mean, of course, the United States, Australia, the, the white world, if you will, right? There's an organic understanding of what it means to belong to a society, which has been a part of all of these cultures, many European cultures, and how this organic understanding of self, of community, is now taken and misdirected in a way that questions the very foundations on which these cultures have developed over the centuries. Take, for example, this pandemic, the excessive measures that were introduced throughout the West and throughout the world, actually, but, but in particular in the West, where people are acting like they would in a high trust society. The right has now been forced to use liberal arguments against something that's inherently illiberal. And what I mean with that is that Various right-wing philosophies believe in collectivism, they believe in a strong authority, a hierarchical society. All of these things are now being used by this postmodern, this uh, post-humanist, post-liberal world, and it's being essentially taken from us, and now they're using it for the wrong ends. So then my argument suddenly becomes, well, wait a second. Maybe the methodology that they're introducing is not what we should be attacking. Maybe it should be the people that are abusing it. In other words, is it bad to live in a society that has a strong hierarchical order? I would say no, not necessarily. Um, is it bad to live in a society where there's a strong collectivist identity? Absolutely not. You have an ancient understanding of how these structures, how these societies are structured. You have an ancient understanding of what it means to belong to a greater whole. You have an ancient understanding of the hierarchical order. And then there's also the individual's position in this society. Liberalism wanted to tear you away from the old order and, and give you a message of saying, well, you should follow your heart, you should be your own person, you are a god, so on and so forth. And now what liberalism is doing is basically reverting to those ancient and natural understandings of, of society and using it against us. 
See, I think the difference is, uh, do we have an organic collectivism or is it an, an artificial one? Right. Currently, we are being forced into an artificial collectivism. Everyone is the same. You know, mm-hmm. it can be can be a black man from Africa. It can be a Chinese man. It could be a Japanese man. It could be a white man. It could be a Portuguese. We're all the same. And we're being forced to live in this artificial form of collectivism. The organic form of collectivism knows only two differences. You're either the child or the parent. Right. If you're the parent, you have a different mindset. You know how it feels to take care of another human being. To tell this human being what to do and what not to do. And it's not only your right, it's your obligation. Mm -hmm. You cannot just let your child run onto the street and get get run over by a car. You'd be a really, really bad father if you did that. Now, what I'm trying to say is they have taken something from us, the organic collectivism, which grows just by, I think Peterson uh, said it, it has just has to do with competence. Right. You have a competent uh, man, and usually it was co- a competent man, and he would be elected to represent a certain amount of people. That's, <laughs> that's how all we had it with the Ting back back in the days, where, where the men would uh, would meet at at a full moon somewhere in the forest and uh, decide on certain issues. And and all of this has been taken away by an entirely artificial form where the individual doesn't count, where the interest groups aren't, aren't um, uh, ah, they don't have to answer any questions anymore. You, you, they, they're not right. liable at, at all. Right. You know, it's, a, you, it's a world see, without see, consequences. Yes, yeah. absolutely. For them, it is. We mm-hmm. bear the consequences. We as the taxpayer. Right. Right. We're paying everything. <laughs> and they're just laughing and, and, you know, getting weapons deals. The pharmaceutical industry is getting rich as as uh, cruisers from from you know from from a coronavirus that, uh, if, if you ask me, has never existed in the first place. It's it's uh, yeah, it's artificial collectivism. I would artificial call it artificial collectivism. That's that's a good way of putting it, and it, and it fits well with the idea of artificial identities that are being promoted nowadays. The themes today, as opposed to these ancient themes of organic uh, realities, of organic understanding of identity, of organic understanding of society are now replaced with this artificial understanding of self, artificial understanding of society, an artificial understanding of the collective. The individuals, let's say the Europeans that had this long tradition are now confused because from a, a methodology point of view, it looks similar, but in reality, it's completely different. And so maybe our job as artists and, and, and people who create, you know, various content creators is to sort of highlight the, the difference between the artificial and the organic. And by highlighting this difference between the artificial and the organic, you know, the European man will then suddenly realize what's going on around him and, and realize uh, that the wool is being pulled over their eyes. Let's take identity of family, right? So you'll have, you know, in the old days, a family meant an extended family. It wasn't just the nuclear family. It was a community. Mm-hmm, of course. And probably around the mid-20th century, it cha- started to change to the nuclear family. And the nuclear family was the father, mother, and the children. But mm-hmm. all of that changed as those children grew up in the 60s, and then everyone became an individual. So now there weren't even nuclear families anymore. Those were being torn up. And so the more you see this, the more it, it devolves into this, not individual, but into this mode of production, this Marxist, even capitalist kind of approach to what it means to be an individual. And so it's all a materialist approach and it strips us away of this spiritual connection, which I think, and then I'm going to circle back again to the German literary aspect, strongly emphasize that people do a lot more research I strongly urge everyone to immerse themselves in German literature because there's a lot of spirituality in German literature. There's a lot of understanding of this connection between the natural and the divine. German literature, in my view, is very passionate. And people always think of Germans as some cold, calculating people, but they're not. They're very passionate individuals. I think so, too. 
So let's go to the next question. What are your thoughts on artistic movements such as Sturm und Drang, German Romanticism, and German Realism? They are all expressions of their time, and mm -hmm. especially of the historic circumstances that went along with it. Sturm und Drang literally is, uh, is oh my good storm and Drang is uh, to force to, to force to force your way in somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, it was almost only young men who wrote these Sturm und Drang. Schiller is like the most prominent example with this, uh, Die Räuber. I think it, it, it was late, seven, late uh, 18th century and you still had these um, small German states, like say Bavaria would have been three or four different states with uh, uh, Oberpfalz and Unterfang, all these mm -hmm. Franconia, so um, little kingdoms here. And so uh, when you wanted to go from Munich to Hamburg, you were crossing through seven or eight different countries. You had to pay uh, tariffs uh, if you were trading. So this extreme federal system made it really, really difficult for people to um, to, ex to do business, to, to, to strive more or less economically. Mm -hmm. And I think this had a big impact on, on the mindset of these young people, because they saw in, in France, hey, look, in France, they can move wherever they want. They're not paying any tariffs anywhere. Why, why do we have to do it? Um, they were very, um, the militaristic aspect was also in, in, in uh, Schiller's life, at least. He had to go, he had to attend a sort of a um, military academy, and he wasn't really happy with it because he was more of that um, poet kind of guy. Then you come to German Romanticism. That was the, the time, more or less, uh, the middle of the 19th century. That's when they have had the revolution in uh, 1848 and the Paulskirche. They turned away from the classic, like the Greek theater, all these uh, sonnet and tragedy and, and these, these traditional forms of, of literature. Mm -hmm. And instead, they turned to sort of this medieval mysticism. So it, it was more or less like the... Um, like this small area between reality and and dream. So this was a big topic uh, in in romanticism. A uh, fun aspect with this uh, revolution in 1848. Now all of a sudden, I, I I don't recall if it was because of that revolution, but in that time period, it became mandatory to have a last name, and because it was this romantic uh, time set, that's when the Jews who lived in Germany had to get a name. A last name, and that's why I have these all these romantic names like Goldberg, like um, Morgenthau, uh, Morning Dew, uh, all these these names that are taken directly from nature, right. all the way to today. Epstein, Epstein, you know, <laughs> it's a it's a certain stone. <laughs> so <laughs> all these all these Jews who originate in Germany or who had come to Germany a couple hundred years uh, early. They now got last names, and because they got them in that time period, that's why they have these romantic uh, last names. And then, of course, with uh, the end of the 18th, uh, end of the 19th century, you had uh, the founding of the empire, of course, um, and all of a sudden Germany became an economic superpower. All of a sudden, they had the bigger commercial fleet than than England, and of course, the English didn't like that at all. The prime minister once said, "I'm I'm sick and tired to see every uh, every other uh, f English fence painted with German paint." So um, that's when they started to to plan the First World War against Germany. Already 16 years after the founding of 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 the German Empire, uh, so that was a huge process, of course. And I think the realism what came after that were, were people like Gottfried Benn these writers who saw this war as sort of a cleansing thing for all this, uh, what had gathered around them. I think it's the same in, in every other country as well, but uh, in, in Germany especially, um, the literature always reflects the, the historic uh, circumstances in which it happens. Germany was very fragmented prior to unification. You had two competing houses, the House of Habsburg, the Austrians in the south. In the north, you had the uh, Hohenzollern house, which was the Prussians. Both of these houses were competing with each other to dominate mm -hmm. the rest of Germany. And, and so that led to several wars between the Prussians and the Austrians. 
but it was also a religious war, the Protestant Prussians, the Catholic Austrians, but it was also about primacy over Germany and the future of Germany. When you're looking at Germany culturally, we also have to mention Gutenberg and the press. Mm -hmm, of course. We also have to mention uh, Martin Luther. If we could just uh, sidetrack on this just quickly for the audience. The difference between Hochdeutsch, High German, as opposed to the various dialects throughout Germany. This essentially evolved with Luther, with Gutenberg, with the Gutenberg press, and it created a stronger understanding, a stronger cohesion of the Germanic peoples. I think uh, people like Goethe and uh, Schiller, they were still writing in their dialect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if if I read Goethe today, I I'm not reading the original, but I'm reading um, a redirected version more or less. With Schiller, uh, he was from uh, Hessen, really broad accent and uh, the Appelvoi. So they have um, it's it's really difficult to say. Uh, let let me let me summarize it that way. Um, the Saxons, the the grammar of the Saxon dialect has become more or less the Hochdeutsch, the High German. And um, the Niedersachsen, the Lower Saxony, they are what we say today, they speak the Oxford German. Uh, mm -hmm. They have this this Hochdeutsch without any accent, really. So uh, this imagine a strip that goes all the way from the very east uh, in Dresden, all the way up to the north northern coast with uh, and the border with, with Holland. Mm -hmm. That's more or less the um the area where some sort of uh, saxonian uh, people uh, live uh, in the very west that's where they speak this high german i'm pretty sure that um, luther was working somewhere in eisenach that would be uh, sachsen anhalt i think today but unfortunately they, they've changed the names around a lot so uh, i'm i'm pretty sure that he was uh, publishing in saxonian and, and I mean, uh, to, to translate the Bible into a vernacular has uh, always been sort of a sacrilege. I mean, uh, uh, I remember in, in Portugal, it was a big deal everywhere. Um, what's his name? Bartolomeo de las Casas, I think he, he translated into uh, Spanish. So whenever you give um, the ordinary people the possibility to to check on what the priest or what the authorities are telling you, that's always sort of a taboo being broken mm -hmm. and uh, that's what luther did but luther actually he was like the, the mainstream uh, critic of of catholic church there were some way way harder dudes like thomas munzer um he was like the first socialist actually luther was only in the in the theological area he was saying listen we have to change this uh, all this aplas handle ah, what's that again uh mm -hmm. You had to, you had to buy, you have to had to give money to the church in order to have your sins taken away from you. So in German, that's Ablasshandel. I can't think of the English word. Uh, so he was a critic of all these um, economic uh, exploits that the Catholic Church was taking from the people. Um, so he was criticizing that. But Münzer, he went further and said, "Listen, uh, we have to change this whole system you now, and, and we have to." Uh, he was really a collectivist. In a, in a very bizarre kind of way. So that was an interesting time in Germany, 16th century. In English, it's called indulgences. Ah, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Let's backtrack a moment here. So we'll say that over the centuries, German identity was fragmented into a tribal understanding, a princely understanding of who belonged to which, which flag, if you will. Well, you have certain exceptions, like the Saxons, the Bavarians had a very strong understanding of identity over the centuries. But then you had these tiny principalities all over Germany that were culturally bound to their neighbors in many cases, but they were politically independent. And so it got to a point where it was so fragmented. You had several hundred of these principalities in what is today Germany in, or what was the Holy Roman Empire. And I think mm -hmm. that over the centuries, this led to a fragmentation of identity of what it meant to be German. This also even fragmented the tribal understanding, the ancient tribal understanding of what it meant to be German. It's a very complicated history because you did have these efforts through various unification attempts. You had this understanding of, 
a larger collective of what it meant to be German. Some would argue that the Dutch are also German. Um, oh, it says so in the national anthem. Yeah, we so, are, we're so of the, German blood, so uh, there's no, uh, see, Dutch, Deutsch, yeah. that's, that's where the name comes from. So they are of German blood. No, there's of course, no question you about it. You know, the, the Dutchmen will not admit this, of course, today, but... They sing it in their national anthem. They do. They do. It's, very it's nothing that they would that they would be really, uh, that they would boast with, because uh, being German has a certain setback these days. But uh, in their anthem, they sing, we are of German blood. So they are it's, well it's, aware. And it's also fascinating that from a cultural point of view, the Germans in the South are very different than the Germans all the way up in the North in Schleswig-Holstein. Oh, yes. Totally different understanding of what it means to be a German. Uh, in the North, it's a lot, lot more similar to the Scandinavian identity than it mm -hmm. is to the Bavarian identity. The Bavarian identity and the Swabian identity is probably more of a Catholic uh, Mediterranean, if you will. I don't want to use that term because it's not, it's maybe an Alpine understanding of what it means to be German. It's not that bad, uh, this expression, because um, uh, the Romans got to them. The Limes was going north north of them. So um, that was more or less the dark Germania where the, the Romans never set foot into. Or, well, they did, but, uh, well, <laughs> they run, ran into some problems with a man named Arminius and uh, they turned back and they never came back. This is actually a really good segue to the next question. So the German literary tradition is rich in detail and has had a profound impact on many cultures throughout Europe and the world. In spite of this, the German cultural spirit is often misunderstood. What are your thoughts on this? Do you remember um, the the movie uh, Inglorious Bastards? Yes. Uh, Christoph Waltz, he was playing uh, an SS officer. Mm -hmm. He was extraordinarily well-versed in Italian, in French, in English, in German. But of course, he was a monster. I think, I think this, this figure from the movie kind of sums up the way, at least that's how I perceive it, how we're being looked at. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we are these distinguished people who you know, are good at recycling and uh, we, uh, we like nudism, you know, <laughs> all these bizarre things that, that other people don't understand. We wear socks in our sandals. <laughs> um, all, all, these, all these stereotypes that, um, that people will think of. Um, we wear lederhosen, we drink uh, incredible amounts of beer from huge glasses. I think it, it's a difficult question for me to, um, to answer because I'm, I'm German. I'm only through English, American movies is it that I get to see how the world perceives me. I don't even own a Lederhosen. Even nowadays, I would really want to have one <laughs> for other reasons. Um, but the cultural spirit, that's such a, such a, can, can you get a bit closer on that? What, what do you mean by that? I mean, there's this very strange misconception about the Germans, in my view. Mm. So on the one hand, there's this tremendous amount of respect for German philosophers, German writers, mm -hmm. German musicians, classical musicians in particular. There's a strong reverence for this aspect of German culture. But it's almost like it's separated through this very clearly defined wall between what this kind of German culture is, and that German culture belongs to everyone. Mm -hmm. But then you have the other German culture, which is the romantic German culture, the, the culture of identity, the culture of understanding what it means to be a German. So that aspect of German identity is demonized to a degree where you have to be extremely careful how you express yourself artistically as a German. Mm -hmm. You have to be very careful how you express yourself in any way as a German, to be honest with you, when it comes to your identity. So the world looks at the Germans through this very bizarre lens, I would say, where they have this cognitive dissonance between the high culture of Germany and then the identity culture of Germany, the organic ah, okay. culture of Germany, the, the natural understanding of what it means to be German. Yeah, somehow 12 years in our history changed uh, the entire people, didn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I think... Uh, what you're referring to is much more a question of the Anglosphere. Mm -hmm. I mean, what happened during World War II was more or less 
you uh, or not you personally, but uh, like Bomber Harris, uh, he nuked 300,000 people to death. Uh, he sent phosphor and, and uh, burning fluids from the sky and uh, that made um, civilians get stuck in the molten, um, molten uh, asphalt. Um, these were hideous war crimes that were committed against Germany. The German so soldiers, they were not considered to be prisoners of war. They were considered as disarmed uh, combatants, I think was mm -hmm. the term. So um, two million of them were starved to death. My my grandfather was, was in one of these camps. He still tells me he hated Americans to the day he died because of the way that he was treated in, in Cherbourg in, in France. So um, I think... This also has to do with, with history. I mean, we have to be demonized. How else would the Anglosphere um, not get into uh, mental problems themselves for, for having done all these war crimes against Germans? Patton said, uh, well, we, we fought the wrong enemy. And I think he was right. And, and speaking of the wrong enemy, the Soviets, and sadly, even to this day, the Russians continue their own version of this mythology were even more brutal and cruel with the Germans post-World War II, and the Hungarians too, by the way. Mm -hmm. Many civilians, not just soldiers, suffered dearly after the Soviet uh, Red Army invaded Germany and, and Central Europe. This is what we're seeing even right now in this struggle that we're seeing in the Ukraine, which is essentially two sides that are using that mythology to justify whatever it is that they want to achieve. And then here we are, Germans, Central Europeans in general, who are stuck in the middle of this. And if we speak up against it and we say, look, we don't want to get involved in this. This is not our struggle. This is not our war. Then immediately you're, you're labeled and demonized. There's this ongoing mythology that's continuing with both the West and the East. So the, the Russians continue to do it and the Americans continue to do it. Who liberated Europe from the evils of nationalism? But getting back to the question, how the German cultural spirit influenced and is misunderstood, in my view, mm -hmm. is rooted in this understanding, because anything that supports or speaks of German identity, national identity, is automatically demonized. Anything that speaks of any kind of European national identity is automatically demonized, but especially Germans, especially Hungarians, for example, these countries um, lost the Second World War, and to this day, if they speak about their national identity, you always have vicious attacks against them. In literature, you see many Germans who try to counter-signal their own people by trying to fit into this narrative. So in modern German literature, I see a lot of people that are self-loathing, but I, I hope you see where I'm going with it. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah, self-hatred is is sort of en vogue in German. There's this, uh, for uh, I, I don't even know what sort of function she has. She has a, um, an African father and a German mother. So mm -hmm. she's there's this um, mixed race woman. Her name is Sarah Lee Heinrich. And she was speaking of a disgusting white uh, society that we have here in Germany. And you can say that. You can, you know, name a certain race disgusting without any uh, repercussions whatsoever. <laughs> um, do this in Africa. I mean, say that you have a disgusting, you know, even even if you were thrown to, to Mugabe, who was killing white people, white farmers, who was, uh, you know, cutting hands off. Um, you, you couldn't say this about him, but you mm -hmm. could say always say it about Germans. And, or, right. and, and that's what I see is that this uh, self-loathing, this, this self-hatred, which originated in Germany, is now being transposed onto other white countries. Exactly. I mean, you Americans, you uh, Australians, you have absolutely nothing to do whatsoever with national socialism. But still, when you want to be some somewhat a nationally minded, uh, sort of a white collective, you are the devil himself uh, you're being portrayed as as evil humans for wanting to uh, have these hom more homogenous communities with this higher level of trust which is necessary to to build something because if if you're spending all your money on on security uh, who's going to do the investment for you know getting some machines to to build stuff 
how are you going to prosper in in a world without any trust where you have to lock your your workshop off like it's a bank it's not going to work you, and as soon as people realize that so hey maybe if, if we're only a white you're the devil himself <laughs> and it is it's so fascinating for me as a german to watch how this uh, former unique trait of germans you know being evil has now been put onto all white people on the planet you you make something, an excellent something point something is being transposed onto onto every white people on the planet which what used to be primarily only german the brainwashing that the germans received after the second world war is being transposed nationalism is an understanding of uh, identity it's an understanding of blood and soil and there's nothing wrong with an understanding of that i don't want to get into the politics of it but from an artistic a cultural understanding there's nothing wrong with loving your country there's nothing wrong with being loyal to your blood and soil there's nothing wrong with that when someone says this openly and this is the excellent point that you're making that in germany this was essentially destroyed this understanding this cultural understanding and anyone who speaks of this today in germany whether it's culturally or god forbid politically then they will be immediately ostracized and immediately in some cases if they're very vocal about it they might even have to face certain legal penalties as well so it's a very dangerous world that we're living in and people don't even realize how dangerous it is in terms of destroying your understanding of self one could argue that the experiment was made in germany and when they saw how successful they were with it in germany they just basically exported this this subversion throughout hmm. the west here we are in the present day and we're trying to figure out what's going on what happened here suddenly they opened the pandora's box and now everything is let loose filled with artificial identities were filled with these artificial uh, associations and were filled with a lot of subversion and self-loathing and and i'm not saying us in particular i have no self-loathing i doubt that you have any self-loathing personally but as a culture and so as a society in general we have a very strong amount of this self-loathing element that's pushing us down and that's something that as artists and as content creators we have to strive to fight against as that mantra would say it's okay to be white it's okay to be german it's okay to be hungarian it's okay to love your people and so this is an interesting point about how this misunderstanding of what the german cultural spirit is has been corrupting all of us it's definitely a deliberate attempt the interesting thing is that um I did a video once on a woman called Reschke, Anja Reschke. She's now the uh, chief, uh, head of political analysts at the uh, German broadcast. And she admitted in the Swiss uh, television that yes, their job was more or less to re-educate the German people. Mm -hmm. And what I've noticed ever since is that um, even the vocabulary is uh, is used like in in german we sh we talk about the schuldkult the mm -hmm. the, the um, guilt cult it's it's really a cult you know um uh, one writer i think was even a jew klonowski he once wrote that um auschwitz is like the the founding myth of the uh, federal republic of germany and he he might be right because you can you can criticize anything anyone you can talk about everything but not about this Right. And uh, even the wording has been translated into English. I think you have something like white guilt now. Yes. Yeah. So uh, even even the uh, even the terminology, the the, the psycho psychology behind it is being used. And you might be very right with with um, with your assertion that that we were more or less a testing ground to see uh, how far can you um neuter people into into hating it, hating itself um and now it's being uh, used against all white nations in the world you yeah. might might be right about this let's jump to the next question here uh which german and and i know we're going back and forth between culture politics and literature but i want to go back to asking you which german literary era appeals to you most and why 
Well, as as you know, th this is a trick question. <laughs> um, it's um, uh, I, I like a lot of literature from all uh, from all areas, but mostly old ones. Uh, I just like language which is precise, whether grammar is correct, whether um, whether there's no English words in it. I mean. You may have noticed that I like speaking English and, and I'm quite well versed in, in, in English language. But still, when I read a German poem, a German book, I'd rather have only German words. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. sort of a purist. And as long as, as a piece of art can can cater to this uh, lust for purity in, in, in the words and the grammar, and uh, uh, then I will uh, then I will enjoy it. It's uh, kind of a basic answer to a general question. I don't know. <laughs> That's an excellent answer. Sometimes I'll get the response that as long as the work of art taps into a greater understanding of the identity of that particular culture, then if that's it, too, if it, honestly, that's too vague. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there's certain um, certain themes that are more appealing to me than others. Annette von droste uh, is a is a woman. She writes about woman things and uh, suppression in the 19th century. Uh, that's uh, that's not my piece of cake, to be honest. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm more into the philosophical texts. Uh, where do we come from? Where do we go? What's the whole purpose of this? And, mm -hmm. and if an author is able to to find like the fraction of an answer to that question in a very small detail, that will always get me off. That's really, that's what I really like about literature. If you can like get a sneak preview into eternity, more or less. Right. <laughs> if, if you want that, to verse it that way. Donald Kent and I, in the Imperium Art Project that we've been working on for the past uh, year and a half, give or take, we've talked about the Imperium as this existential realm in which all people of European descent can tap into and find unity, find a cultural commonality, find a place or a location where we can reconnect or find bonds that bring us closer together and collaborate in that existential space and that creative space. If there's a message that taps into this I would call it a divine absolute that transcends history, that is this continuum, whether we want to call it the Imperium, whether we want to call it the Imperium of the Brotherhood of the European Man, whether we want to call it the Imperium of God. I think that we need to tap into something that's greater than us, that taps into not just our current world, but also into our ancestors as well, mm -hmm. so that where we can then connect with our medieval ancestors, with our ancient ancestors, through our creative process. Absolutely. There's one author who I really like a lot. His name is Christian Morgenstern. He's a Jewish author. He has this great way of, it, it's called supervision. Here in Germany, we're using some English words different from their real meaning. I'd say this school, has problems between um, the staff and there is problems within the staff. Now they will call someone to come over and uh, they will have a talk. And this person is called the supervisor, mm -hmm. not in the way that because he's looking from the top onto the situation that these people are in and in order to give them some recommendations on what they can change. And this Morgenstern, he was a brilliant supervisor in that way because he um, he was a very good observer. He wrote one poem that's called The Impossible Fact, more or less. The final phrase in, in that poem has become somewhat of, an, of a proverb in German. Weil nicht sein kann, was nicht sein darf. Because what must not be, cannot be. That's also one aspect of the, of the German um, blind obedience, you would call it. You can tell it today with... Either is it the mask mandate, whatever. A huge amount of Germans are still unable to even imagine that their government is lying to them. 
that's what he observed really well. Yeah, that's um, what I like uh, about the supervision uh, from foreign people here in Germany. But of right. course, these days, uh, hundreds of thousands of, uh, I don't know, African dancers and artists and music um, is actually, if you if you just stop with your car here in Germany at, at the red traffic light, you will have some some uh, acrobats jumping in front and then going around with a hat uh, collecting money. We're sort of overwhelmed with artists from all over the world. I remember Germany from the 80s, and I think Germany from the 80s in comparison today was a lot more innocent than it is today. You saw the subversion already from the 60s, obvious. You had the student po protests mm. in the 60s, a lot of Maoists, a lot of uh, Marxist influence. But I don't even know if I would call Marxism a foreign influence more than a, uh, a foreign misinterpretation of something that's German, very German. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe a misdirection. So you had the student protests of the 60s that were still very influential in the 80s Germany that I was that I lived in. And but still, I would say that the 80s Germany was very much steeped in the Cold War mythology. It was a different kind of uh, maybe innocent is not a good word. Maybe um, naive would be a better word. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and so so maybe the best way to put it is that the the cultural landscape of Germany of the 80s was very naive. But in the last 30 years post Cold War, Germany has transformed into something that is very unrecognizable to me. And when I go back to Germany and I visit my friends in Germany, I see a completely different cultural landscape. And to me, it's very saddening because, of course, I only visit every so often. So I see these changes very dramatically. Mm. Yeah, these Maoist uh, uh, protesters from back then, they are now running this country. Exactly. That's why uh, everything is going to shit in plain English. Yep. You know, um, there's no values at all. You know, they're lying. <laughs> Everyone knows that they're lying, but nobody cares. Right. They're wasting our money. They're telling us in the face, look, we're just wasting our money. We're throwing it out the window. For as long as the Germans don't have it, it's good. Joschka Fischer, former uh, foreign secretary, said that, or actually wrote that in a book. So they're telling us what they're doing. It's, it's more or less a genocide on the German people, and whoever speaks up is a right-wing extremist. Exactly. <laughs> it's uh, Yeah, it's pretty simple. Quite and sad, and, and you... At times, you know, you get really uh, aggressive when, when, uh, but then you realize, okay, you know, you're just wasting your energy, put your energy into something useful. You have a very difficult situation in Germany where you see this almost like getting back to that experiment in Germany being transposed to the West. And in Germany, it's become a much stronger religion than almost anywhere else in the West. Let's go to this next question about religion. How have religion and faith impacted German identity as it relates to the artistic expression? I remember something from my school time because I lived pretty close to the small little chapel where they found this. It's called the Wesselbrunner Gedicht, Wesselbrunner poem. I'll just read that out because it's, it's pretty short. This I experienced among men of the greatest of wonders, that the earth was not, nor the sky above it, nor tree, nor mountain, nor anything, nor the sun shone, nor the moon shone, nor the glorious sea. And there was nothing of ends and boundaries. There was the one almighty God, the mildest of men. There was also many divine spirits with him and the holy God. So this is from 790. This is how old the um, literature of Germany goes back. Um, I, I try to to read that myself. It's uh, it, it's written in very old scripture. I, I couldn't figure a word out, to be honest. 790 Wesselbrunn means it was in Bavaria. That means the Romans had been there. It means it was uh, more in the Catholic area, which had been um, uh, Christianized pretty early compared to uh, the Saxons with Vidokind from Karl the Great, was in 800-something. 
the first writing was done in equestrial ways. So only monks knew how to read and write. So this is where literature really comes from in old Europe. I, I presume in Hungary it's pretty much the same thing. Yes, yes, it's very similar. So, yeah, um, yeah I mean, what we know today is literature uh, is is uh, entertainment more or less. You know, it's uh, but uh, these these um, religious texts they were they had a um, a higher value to the people. They were they had a different um, aspect to why they were written as well. Mm -hmm. You know, they were to 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 build up the soul, to to raise the soul towards God, to understand what all this is all about. And interestingly enough, uh, literature, especially poetry, is more into the details of this godly thing, this divine. Why are we here? Where do we, where, we, where do we come from? Where are we going? And and to find a sense in all this. This is to me more or less the the whole idea behind literature. You know, yeah. what we, what's this all about? You know, there's definitely the philosopher poet, and then there's also the warrior poet as well. That's where when you mentioned that Schiller didn't want to fight or be a soldier, just wanted to backtrack to what you said earlier about Schiller, mm -hmm. because. The whole concept of poetry from ancient times and throughout our history has a very strong martial element to it as well. You have a very strong uh, warrior poet ethos, and I think that the poet stands somewhere between the warrior and the priest as reflecting the mm -hmm. metaphysical, but also reflecting the uh, martial aspect of what it means to be man what it means to be here. And so you have the uh, martial aspect of fighting, striving, of, of not giving up, of vanquishing your enemies, or of mm. standing up for your people and rising up in defense of your people. And then you have the philosophical, metaphysical aspect of the poet. I, I would say probably Schiller was more the philosopher poet than he was the warrior poet. I'm very happy that you're putting a strong emphasis in this particular instance on the philosopher poet. And I find it very fascinating, for example, that from the German mindset, and this is again, circling back to the misunderstanding of what it means to be German of the German spirit, the German spirit is very philosophical, very spiritual. And you see a lot of German poets who are closer to that philosopher poet than they are the warrior poet. I think so too. Um, I read a couple of years ago. I read the uh, the biography of um, Lothar von Richthofen. He was the mm -hmm. younger brother to Manfred from Richthofen, the um, Red Baron. He was called. So this this world famous World War One uh, fighter plane pilot. These men, they were philosophers. If you read just the, the what they write in their diaries, it's it's fascinating. Richthofen, he painted his his. Uh, his plane in in as the the brightest red that he could find. It was uh, like the knights back in medieval times. They didn't wear camouflage. They wanted to be seen. You know, it was in fight, man against man, open face. Uh, whereas today, you know, you're wearing camouflage clothes. You, you're hiding somewhere and and you're trying right. to shoot the guy from two miles away in the head. It, it was a, a, an entirely different sort of men that we had a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. Real knighthood meant something to these men. Someone from the United States, he sent me a picture of a, of a, a small booklet of poems from an SS officer, presumably a pretty high one. And these were the most delicate verses I'd ever read about boys, you know, a boy sitting in, in a little boat and he wants to be a captain one day. This imagery of, of the evil men of, of the SS and of of the Wehrmacht is just the, the biggest nonsense in the world. These were really uh, philosophical warriors, more or less. Right. The, right. The, the, the more I read about these men, the more impressed I am with with their um, yeah with their spirit. And they touched upon that eternal spirit, that eternal warrior spirit, but they addressed it in a very philosophical way. That's a very uniquely German way of approaching things in general, literary or 
culturally or even artistically? I wouldn't even say that's a typical German thing. I think that's a typical white thing. If you look into Skargard, this philosophical warrior, uh, it's an ideal that the man is is uh, to strike for, like Heraklid, mm -hmm. like Hercules. These are prototypes mm -hmm. of of men that uh, serve sort of as an orientation for for the average man. Look, here's your superhero, and uh, you don't even need superpowers. You need this and this and this virtue, diligence and bravery and all this, and then you can get there too. Yes. That's kind of like the point of the Bildungsroman as well, you know, this coming-of-age novel in German literature, which is a very uniquely German thing, where they speak of virtues, of morals, of the the responsibility that you have towards your mm. community. And of uh, I'll be honest, I had to read uh, one or two of these in school, and I always found them terribly boring because I was a teenager back then. And, uh, you know, nothing is more boring uh, uh, as virtue when you're a teenager. We have to be very cognizant of the different demographics, the different generations that we're speaking to. A younger generation wants to see a lot of action. They want to see a lot of movement. They want to see a lot of immediate results. The older generation is more contemplative. The older generation wants to see reflection. And it's expressed through an understanding of the years that they experienced themselves and how they can identify with that work of art. It becomes a very interesting uh, question as far as what we want to do and how the Germans have to then now, going forward, redefine themselves, I think, in a very positive way, artistically, to reconnect with that organic understanding of ethnos and to reconnect with that organic understanding of nationalism. I think mm -hmm. that it's important to highlight these positive aspects and really focus on it in a way that appeals to multiple generations. And I know this is a very difficult goal to achieve, but I think it is something that we should strive toward. So modern German poetry, how is that different from the romantics of the or the uh, the German realists or see with with. Uh... Modern poetry came more or less, um, uh, it was stripped of all form. It was what I like to call Laba Lyric. So there was usually some, well, let's put it that way, she wasn't very attractive, some not very attractive women writing uh, bad poems about, you know, finding the ideal man for themselves. This is how I perceive it. I, I can't really say anything. I, honest to God, I stopped uh, reading modern literature because it just uh, drives me crazy. I, I find no gate to these thoughts. Uh, there's a guy called uh, Erich Fried. He's he's a celebrated uh, uh, poet here in Germany. <laughs> Most boring things you could imagine. There's mm. no, I don't know, it, it's lost all spirit. It's just this... If you imagine you were to exaggerate the Frankfurt School mm -hmm. and, and seeing everything as subjective, um, this is subjectively good in their heads when they write it and, and it stops right there. Right. I don't know. It's, it's, I, I've never found any way of, of accessing this um, sort of literature. I'm sorry. It's very, it's very pretentious. <laughs> I yeah. I, I, I yeah. It's, it's pre it. pretentious is a good word to, to, uh, to describe it. It's, it's, it's like this very subjective way of, of uh, telling everyone about problems uh, that you don't, you know, no one cares about, more or less. Exactly. Then let me ask you this question. Who's your favorite German poet? Hmm. Actually, it's Hermann Hesse. Um, Interesting. But mostly because I used to own... Uh, a book with with his poems, and uh, I, I was in a very influential age when when I got that, like I think uh, beginning of my twenties. Uh, oh no, a bit bit earlier, like eighteen, nineteen, I was, and uh, he had this great way of um, he he was funny in a way. So Hermann, to Johannes dem Täufer sprach Hermann der Säufer, to Johannes the um, 
John, John the Baptist. Johannes ah, the Teufel. Yeah, so that, yeah. John the Baptist spoke uh, Herman the Drinker. So, um, and uh, he's, he's making these uh, rhymes that are just great. And uh, I'd read many, many of his books before. Untam Rad, uh, Under the Wheel. Uh, then there's uh, Siddhartha, which is the story of how Buddha came to place. He he was very deeply influenced with um, with this um, Buddhist and with this Indian philosophical touch, and uh, th that made me later on actually uh, study Indology. So um, I, I've studied the Indian languages and culture because more or less of Hermann Hesse. Okay. Also, he was he was one reason for it. So uh, yeah, that that guy influenced me a lot. But then there's others as well, you know. As I've uh, as I've said, there's there's some p p poems from Goethe that I know by heart even today because I had to learn them in school and and uh, but not in that way that oh I got it I got to learn them by heart because uh, you, you read them and they're like wow this is so cool you know if if you can if you can just um say this in a in a conversation when it when it fits you know like you're like the hero you know you walk in where it's like this da 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 you can put these uh, imaginary sunglasses on and and you're just uh, the absolute dude and then there's your Achim Ringelnatz there's um several of his poems that I really like because he's writing about these little things, these, mm -hmm. these tiny aspects between individuals that in, because they occur so many times, they have a sort of uh, relevance to the entire society. I, I think I could best illustrate that with one poem. Mm -hmm. Do I have time to read a poem? You can read as many poems as you'd like. This is about giving a gift. I'll read it in German first because that way you can you can understand why I it has a very nice matrix and everything. Schenken. Schenke groß oder klein, aber immer gediegen. Wenn die Bedachten die Gaben wiegen, sei dein Gewissen rein. Schenke herzlich und frei. Schenke dabei, was in dir wohnt, an Meinung, Geschmack und Humor, so dass die eigene Freude zuvor dich reichlich belohnt. Schenke mit Geist ohne List. Bei ein Gedenk, dass dein Geschenk du selber bist. That means, more or less, to give a gift. Give big or small, but always dignified. When the recipients weigh the gifts, your conscience should be clean. Give heartily and freely, give thereby what dwells in you, of opinion, taste and humor, so that your own joy before rewards you abundantly. Give with spirit without cunning, be mindful that your gift is you yourself. As I was saying, these, these little things like bringing someone a present over. For instance, I have a really good neighbor and he loves beer. And I've brewed my own beer. So um, what I gave him, of course, was a bottle of my home brew. And that was part of me. And when he drank it, he was weighing this gift. So these are more or less not only poems, but these are like aphorisms that you can take for daily use. And that's what I really like about Ringelnatz, because he, uh, he does that a lot. Now, that's a great poem, by the way. And I, and I found it to be very important and also very typical of the German mentality, by the way. Of How, being, how's that? Because the Germans are very particular about who they associate with. They're very particular about who mm -hmm. they call a friend. The symbolism of every action is very important to a German. Who do you give a gift to? How do you present something? What are you saying to that person? Um, so all of these little nuances are very important to a German, at least traditionally they were, um, where you have a lot of these very nuanced customs in Germany, gift giving being one of them. It's mm -hmm. a very important aspect that is kind of lost in, in many parts of the West, sadly. But it's still alive in Germany, I think, at least uh, among the older generation. I think so, too. Many, many things, especially if, if the last time you were in Germany was in the 1980s. Um, it's, it's barely recognizable from, from, from there. 
Oh, I was I, I was mean, in Germany since then many times. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I, I I was there well many times many times, but the last time I was there was about four or five years ago, give or take. And uh, you know, I mean, I go every so often back to Germany. I, like I said, I have many friends over there, but I see these changes. You know, when I meet my friends in Germany, our small circle still has that old those old customs. <clears throat> this mm, old I, understanding yeah, okay, of, of, I understand. Yeah. But but outside, when you see it, I, I can't really tell you whether or not this is still the case in Germany, if that makes sense. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Of course. Um, so do you have any other poems you would like to read? Yes, uh, definitely. Um, of course, Goethe, everyone knows him. He he combines these aspects. I mean, he he was a biologist. He was a bot botan. He was uh, well versed in botany and all all these uh, different uh, sciences, more or less. And this is the the poem that I had to uh, learn by heart. It's called "Gefunden," which means found. Ich ging im Walde, so für mich hin, um nichts zu suchen. Das war mein Sinn. Im Schatten sah ich ein Blümchen stehen, wie Sterne leuchtend, wie Äuglein schön. Ich wollte es brechen, da sagt es fein, soll ich zum Welken gebrochen sein? Ich grub's mit allen den Würzlein aus, zum Garten trug ich's am hübschen Haus, pflanzt es wieder am stillen Ort, nun zweigt es immer und blüht sofort. And that translates into I walked in the forest, just to myself, and nothing to seek, that was my purpose. In the shade I saw a little flower standing, shining like stars, like a pair of beautiful eyes. I wanted to break it, then it said finally, shall I be broken to die? I dug it up to its smallest roots, I carried it to the garden by the pretty house, and planted it again in the quiet place, now it always branches and continues to bloom. That's why I was so strong on this aspect of the German and, and their love for nature. Mm -hmm. You don't just break a, a flower and put it in a vase, you know, you, you dig it out and and then you have it. Uh, we have this huge word and especially the Green Party, they love that word for, for decades. Nachhaltigkeit. You do an investment and it will continuously give profit, mm -hmm. more or less. Or uh, you store something and it will not rot. That's right. nachhaltig. So, um and, and and they just love that word, but uh, they're doing the exact opposite of what nachhaltig actually is. I mean, well, that's uh, the problem, right? Exactly. <laughs> yes, uh, that they're just uh, hear us with the mouth, with Maulhelden, we say in German. Yep. This is also about the the theme of soil. I I noticed in this book mm -hmm. also very important. Oh yes, of course. As I as I was saying, nature, um, the soil. It you, you don't you don't break something. You you dig it out and and if if you want to keep it i mean he was a biologist he he should know it doesn't translate of course perfectly into english and the funny thing is there was a an, a guy from iraq and he said uh, that the german language was too difficult and that we should get rid of the umlaute the us and so forth yeah the uncanny thing is what happens if you omit uh, the umlaut you have a complete different poem Und blut sofort, which means instantly blood. Right. So from it continues to bloom to instantly blood with just yep. these two dots. Yep. And and I thought there was okay. Now this is pretty, pretty intense change for just two two dots on a U. I mean, I wrote a funny a funny article with that with my brother um, because he's learned Arabic. And uh, he knows just how complex Arabian uh, grammar is. And, and uh, it was just, uh, if you know how complex their grammar is and their their orthography, such a statement about a foreign language of the country which took you up as a war refugee, whatever he was, you come to a country and you want their language to change for you. Right. I mean, seriously, how blunt can you be? Well, that's the problem, right? So, so there has to be a point where people have to say enough, and I think we're yeah, and, very and, close to that point. Yes, and unfortunately, uh, there's no one who who stands up and says, "Look, now this is really you've crossed the line here." The chancellor just said a couple of weeks ago, "There are no more red lines for this mm -hmm. government." 
You know, I mean, what does that mean? Right. Everything goes. And this is actually what they're going at. Yep. That was expected with this government. This red-green coalition is just a disaster for Germany now. And I'm very concerned about the future. I've been concerned about the future of Germany for many years, uh, more from a cultural perspective and a social perspective. Now I'm very concerned about Germany also from an economic perspective. I love Germany. I, for my formative years were in Germany. Um, uh, I have fond memories of my time in Germany. Mm. I, I have very, um, a very close affinity to the German people, the German culture, the language, country. It's almost like a, a third home for me. I mean, in my case, Eod, who's a, uh, a French artist in uh, the White Art Collective, he, he said, I have my feet in, in both continents, Europe and, and the United States. But it's even more complex than that in a way, because my feet are in in Hungary, in Germany, in Austria, and in the United States. So I'm an octopus in a way. <laughs> a quadruped. <laughs> or a quadru- exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, g- makes a firm stance too. So. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So do you have another poem would you like to uh, share with us? Yes, um, the, the Christian Morgenstern that I was uh, talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's, I just love these, the, the way that they're, the rhyme and the metrics uh, are carrying these sentences. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I'll just start. Palmström, etwas schon an Jahren, wird an einer Straßenbeuge und von einem Kraftfahrzeuge überfahren. Wie wahr, spricht er, sich erhebend und entschlossen weiterlebend möglich, wie dies Unglück ja, dass es überhaupt geschah. Ist die Staatskunst anzuklagen in Bezug auf Kraftfahrwagen? Gab die Polizeivorschrift hier dem Fahrer freie Trift? Oder war vielmehr verboten, hier Lebendige zu Toten umzuwandeln, kurz und schlicht? Durfte hier der Kutscher nicht. Eingehüllt in feuchte Tücher prüft er die Gesetzesbücher und ist also bald im Klaren, Wagen durften hier nicht fahren. Und er kommt zu dem Ergebnis, nur ein Traum war das Erlebnis, weil, so schließt er messerscharf, nicht sein kann, was nicht sein darf. The translation, let's see if, if that uh, gives you a good hint of where it's going. Palmström, something already in years, is hit at a road bend and run over by a motor vehicle. How was He speaks, getting up and resolutely living on, possible, how this misfortune that it happened at all. Is the statesmanship to be accused with regard to motor vehicles? Did the police regulation grant free drift to the driver? Or was it rather forbidden to turn the living into dead ones? Briefly and simply, was the driver not allowed here? Wrapped in wet cloth, He checks the law books and is immediately clear. Carriages were not allowed to drive there. And he comes to the conclusion, the experience was just a dream. Because, he concludes razor sharp, what must not be, cannot be. And as I've stated earlier, this is this perspective from from someone outside of the German people. Mm -hmm. uh, to, To see this just, you know... It's the same thing now. See, we have people, uh, there was a, a, a guy from an insurance company and uh, he issued some numbers from almost 11 million of the people uh, insured with his company. And he's, he said that if you were to take the side effects of this, let's call it vaccination, to calculate the entire number of people who were, had to go to the doctor, had to see a doctor because of this, uh, these side effects. He estimates that between two and a half and three million people had to see a doctor after these vaccinations. Out of some 70 million people vaccinated, or not even 65. So that's like, I don't know, 5% or something like that, if, right. if I'm correct. That's a big, so, that's a large So percentage. that's a huge number. But... Mm-hmm. People are still saying, no, no, our government isn't lying. What must not be, cannot be. This is such a close uh, look at, at the German mentality, this, this blind obedience. Mm-hmm. You know, the government is saying the, the vaccination is safe. 
and the vaccination is safe. And right. you're a right-wing extremist if you're criticizing any of this. Exactly. It's, it's so amazing. Let me go to the last question. How could the greater European and white community learn from the German cultural and historic experience? As I've told you, I'm, I'm very much into words. And uh, words have a long history and they change subtly and, and whatever. But in Germany, we talk of Stamm. Stammbaum is like the family tree. Mm -hmm. And the Stamm is the trunk of the tree. So these Stämme, as we call them, the tribes in Germany, they are called the trunk of the tree, of the family tree, more or less. The English word tribe comes from the German, at least that's my um, suspicion, comes from the German word Trieb, which is a shoot. It comes out of a tree. The Anglers were a tribe in the, in the north, close to Frisia, and the Saxons, you know, this wider area. And I think these people were well aware that they were shooting off from the mainland, from the family tree, and starting something new. And it's, it's buried in this language. So in other words, there's no difference between Germans and Anglo-Saxons or, or Anglospheric people. We do share a common ancestry. We do share a common way of looking at the world. I think that's the reason why American movies are so popular in Germany. That's why we like, for instance, uh, Germans just love um, Monty Python. You know, all these, uh, all these cultural aspects. Mr. Bean, he's like a huge star here, Brown Atkinson. So um, not only because we had our own comedians taken away from us. There are still some German comedians that are pretty good and doing well. I think that we do share sort of a common way of looking at the world. English mm -hmm. and German are not that far apart from each other. What, what do you think that the German cultural and historic experience can provide this greater community? We're closer to the roots, let's put it that way. So yeah. what you're saying is that the root comes from the European Germanic tradition then, this profound bond that brings these different cultures together. Yes, absolutely. We're, we're one blood. Really? Within the blood, the information from our ancestors is transported with the blood to the individual. Mm -hmm. And this structure on top of it, we call family, is, is like the, the, the one single cell for our entire society. The language is just one small aspect. It's, it's incredibly enriching, and that, that's what, what literature and poetry make, uh, expresses how you use the words in, in both languages. It's the mother tongue, Muttersprache. Mm -hmm. So our mother teaches us the words from the ancestors. Right. That way we get to express ourselves in mm -hmm. the language that our mother gave us. The father defends the country, the fatherland, Vaterland. In the language are buried underneath the very concepts of how the world around us works. Mm -hmm. You have a father and a mother. Why else would they be trying to tell us that a man can be a woman and start uh, swimming with the women? Everything that is happening around us is evil. It's just plain evil. They're trying to distract us from the core of ourselves, which is you're born to a mother from a father. They, they shape you into the person that you are, but your ancestry, your blood is more or less the, the core in that vessel that mm -hmm. will then develop to the man or the woman that you are. And all and of this happens uh, within the bloodline. Of course, from, from where else should the influences come? Right. Of course, you can you can travel to India. You can you can do meditation. You can smoke weed in Jamaica, but still, you're German uh, or Hungarian or whatever. That does not change, and certainly your sex doesn't change. Right. So this this consistency in your life that gives you something to hold on to, and and that's what the, these roots and that's a, that's what's being plugged out, one by one. What we understand as German is not what we're seeing today. Mm. What we understand as German has roots that go back to antiquity. That's the German 
tradition that we have to rekindle. In my experience, German culture historically is a very passionate culture. It's a very philosophical culture. Mm -hmm. It's a culture that is deeply connected to a metaphysical reality. The Germans are very structured individuals who believe in hierarchical order. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that is a blessing and a curse for the Germans. Because when you have good leaders, it elevates you. When you have bad leaders, it leads you to destruction. Today, we have very bad leaders in Germany, bad actors who are leading the Germans down a very treacherous path. Is the problem with the German understanding of self or is the problem with the leadership? And I would argue that the problem is with the leadership. So if Germany has responsible leaders who care for their people, who care for the well-being of the German people, of the way we understand it traditionally, then that can elevate the German people. But if you have this mishmash of open borders, cultural relativism, ethnic and racial relativism, then that ultimately will lead to self-destruction. So I think that the lesson for the greater white community is to take these positive elements and transpose these positive elements into a better understanding of our community, how we want to define it with the leadership that we feel would work best for us. We must focus first on identity before we focus on ideology. When your identity is strong and you understand who you are, when you know where you come from, you know where you're going. When you have this strong foundation of a natural organic identity, then the ideology will be very easy for you to define because there are going to be ideologies that will either enhance this or there are going to be ideologies that are going to destroy this. Then it's an obvious choice for you to take elements of those ideologies that enhance you as opposed to those that destroy you. But you can't really make that choice if you make ideology your primary identity as opposed to your organic understanding of self. I'm a person, I believe that uh, we're being reborn all the time, that mm -hmm. more or less uh, our ancestors um, reincarnate in, in our bodies, in the bodies of their children, great, 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 great grandchildren. If you want to increase your identity towards your whiteness, read fairy tales, especially the German ones. Brüder Grimm, they, they lived um, somewhere after Romanticism. They were actually linguists. They, they wrote the, one of the first comprehensive German uh, dictionaries. They also wrote up all these previously only um, orally uh, carried on fairy tales from all over Germany. An oral tradition is what they call it. Oh, yes, exactly. The only oral tradition um, fairy tales, and they wrote them all up. Like everything you've seen in Disney, from Cinderella I don't know, uh, Snow White, uh, Snow White, all of these fairy tales were originally from white people, most of them from Germans. Some of them are actually French, but this is more or less our heritage from the super, super early age on. I don't know if you've heard of a guy named Vark Vikernes. Yeah, uh, he, yeah. he used to have a um, YouTube channel. He's written a couple of books. And they might help you, especially the one, uh, Paganism Explained, Part One. It's a super thin book, maybe 30 pages. It's more of a pamphlet. And this might uh, get you an idea for all of our listeners of how to interpret these fairy tales. Because these are super old, probably tens, tens of thousands of years old. They all go uh, about how does this reincarnation happen? So you, you touch these little... Buddhist uh, aspects here. It's it's uh, it, it's it's actually above my English to to uh, to explain. It's no, that's uh, okay. I I totally I understand what you're saying. I I think that it's very important. We have quite a few. Uh, no, because you were stressing because you were stressing that the identity comes before the ideology. Yes, it does. Yeah. You have to know who you are, and and this. For me personally, reading old fairy tales and seeing them from this new perspective that gave me a, a great, uh, like a super boost to understanding my identity. Mm -hmm. 
we are our ancestors reborn. If you see that there's no, um, uh, there's no gap. See that we are the same people more or less. I mean, it would be a pretty waste of of souls and of of consciousness to dispose of this consciousness, and at the same time, the universe doesn't lose a single yota of of energy. It's not a molecule of of matter ever lost. It's just transformed. And the same thing for me personally is true with the consciousness of a human being. So mm -hmm. we are our ancestors. We definitely carry the bloodline. We definitely carry the DNA of our ancestors. Yeah, but what is very consciousness? Least. It's, it's, a, yeah. it's information. Yeah. So, and most likely we are made of light because, you know, the most... Um, the fastest way of transmitting information is via light. You have these uh, glass fiber in German um, glass fiber connections. Mm -hmm. This is the fastest way of of sharing information today. In the same way that our biology of our biological bodies are transferring information, we're just light. Yeah, through fiber optics today. That's the uh, yeah fiber optics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that that's my and and once you you don't believe that. But once you're absolutely convinced that that uh, you are a being of light which lives on eternally, you won't have any fears left, which is a nice thing to have because all this fear of atomic warfare, of uh, Fukushima, of uh, Corona, of all these things, you have an identity, you know. That, well, that's that the thing. Yeah. Saves you a great deal of uh, anguish, actually. Well, if you understand your identity through your ancestors, whether that's through a metaphysical manifestation, whether that's through a religious tradition, whether that's through a biological understanding of it, we're in between the, the, the spiritual world and we're also in this reality that we're living in right now. And in this reality, we have very defined connections. We have de defined ancestries. And so all of this, all of these layers of identity, I think, are very important in order for us to understand ourselves. And, and I think that the German tradition, being that it's so ancient, there's a lot that the Germans have given the world over the centuries, a lot of positive things that the German culture and tradition has given the world. We go further back and we understand the entirety of the message. Now, in this particular case, we're talking about the German culture, the German experience, right? When we're talking about this, then there's a lot that we can learn from our ancestors today. And I think that's really what we're getting at here. Our ancestors live through us. It's always about honoring your ancestors. That's a primary thing. It's It, it always goes back to the Stamm. It always goes back to mm -hmm. the roots, right? And I think that that's, that's really an important message today that a lot of people in the broader white community, the broader European community, whether or not you're from Italy, whether you're from England, Spain, the United States, it doesn't matter. Honoring that root is really what matters most. And I think that the Germans really capture this well if you look at it in the German cultural entirety. Yeah, I think so too. Do you have any last thoughts that you would like to share with the audience? Uh, yes. Um... In respect to what you were saying about honoring your ancestors, what we also need to do is to see ourselves as part of nature rather than as some sort of a gardener over nature. Mm -hmm. When you start to realize that, um, for instance, the, the position of the, uh, of the sun has a certain impact on you, that the summer solstices and the longest and the shortest day, um, you have Christmas on the shortest day of the year. So all of these celebrations that we have around the year are of also Germanic root. So mm -hmm. these people, my ancestors and myself, we have been celebrating that we have sort of a dependency on nature, but also a reliability. For one thing, you're depending on nature, but you can also rely on it. And this right. is a, sort of the relationship that Germans can teach you about being part of nature rather than, you know, being the superior gardener of nature. I that's think a, that's my last word on that, because it is also about ancestry, of course, but it's 
if you talk about identity over ideology, it's really see yourself within your, your community and within the year. And mm -hmm. if you have this, you have space and time. This is the two main things. And the other things just come about. That's a beautiful way to end this great conversation that we had. Before we end this episode, could you please tell the audience where they may be able to find you and your work? Currently, I'm uh, doing a uh, YouTube channel. It's the Cone Bruder at YouTube. And also on Telegram, we always spell the same. C-O-E-L-L-N-B-R-U-E-D-E-R. -L -L -E -E That's um, Cone Bruder. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I had a wonderful time speaking with you. Thank you again for sharing your time and your thoughts. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for granting me your time and patience. It is through art that we can achieve the highest standards of decorum and elegance. It is through art that we can move our brothers and sisters to finally awaken. It is through art that we can seek the face of God. I hope all of you and your families stay safe during these precarious times. Focus on what matters. Our people have been through worse, and we will always rise again. Our strength lies in our ability to love and respect each other. Our strength is defined by our ability to set aside our differences and fight alongside each other as sons and daughters of Europa. Our unique legacy represents many different faiths and traditions, and we must tap into our eternal continuum to find ways where we can both connect with each other and find strength in unity. We must work hard to forge our Imperium and build our new civilizational destiny. I will end this episode with a song by Richard Wagner from Das Rheingold, the epic opening of Wagner's ring cycle titled Abendlich strahlt der Sonne Auge. The music was provided by the website Muse Open, where they quote, provide recordings, sheet music and textbooks to the public for free without copyright restrictions. Put simply, our mission is to set music free, close quote. Have a good evening.